Hi, Philadelphia. We are here with uh, Ethan Itzkow, the co-director and co-writer, along with Serena Ryan of High Score. I'm Elliot Ratzman, longtime friend of the festival, now the chair in Jewish studies at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. Ethan, thanks for being here with us. So Ethan, uh, why don't you tell the Philadelphia audience a little bit about yourself, how you came to do this short with your uh, writing directing partner? Sure, yes. Uh, for those who don't know, I uh, co-wrote and co-directed this with my partner and life partner, Serena Ryan. Uh, and the way that we came about this film was that we were working together on an international tour of a musical. And we were out of the country for about two years. And that was when all of, let's say the large scale events of um, the last five years had been happening. Charlottesville and um, other events driven by white supremacy. And we were outside the United States and we really didn't feel like we could do anything effective other than the donations that we had already been making or whatever calls we could make uh, to representatives. And so we were in Los Angeles on a layover between legs of our tour showing another film of ours um, at Holly Schwartz Film Fest. And the Poway Synagogue shooting happened. And that was, of course, six months to the day after the Tree of Life massacre. And that weighed really heavily on us. And we felt that it was very much tied to um, the situation at the border that at the time the Trump administration was making into a humanitarian disaster. And we embarked on a large period of research and found that our feelings were justified, that there's something called the great replacement conspiracy theory that we explore in the film that, uh, of course, uh, if the audience doesn't know, that's where <laughs> white supremacists blame Jews for the success of minorities and women and for immigrants to the United States coming in to destroy or replace white culture. Patently ridiculous. That's when in Charlottesville, when they were the Tiki Torch neo-Nazis were chanting, Jews will not replace us. And we all looked at each other and were like, what? What were they? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what they meant. That that in their mind, Jewish people are trying to replace white people in the United States. What they don't say is like, as the oppressor class, like in kind of an intimating that. So we found that this conspiracy theory has a primary victim around the world, which is uh, new immigrant communities here in the United States that's translated into Latinx immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers. And around the world where this conspiracy theory plays out, that would be against um, mostly Muslim immigrants and refugees from the Syrian crisis, from uh, Iraq, Turkey. And um, in New Zealand, that's how it played out. In the Christchurch massacre, that was driven by the same conspiracy theory. What kind of research did you all do to sort of prep for um, getting the, let's say, the, the, the radicalization or red pilling of this, um, what first seems to be just a prejudiced dude at turning him into a kind of militant ripe for radicalization? So we delved into the whatever available biographical information there was on some of these mass shooters, such as the Charleston shooter, and of course the Poway and the Pittsburgh shooters, um, and found a very common thread amongst their lives in terms of their online presence and what they were posting and what they were talking about. We also read some um, really platinly disgusting Nazi novels, neo-Nazi novels that were written in the 60s and 70s. Um, I won't repeat the titles here because there's no need for that. Uh, but the conspiracy theory showed up. It's been, it's just a re amalgamation of the protocols of the elders of Zion. So it's, you know, it's not like a new idea. Um, but the, the real research, the way that we brought this into the modern era is the fact that this is happening so much in the digital space. Uh, in these internet echo chambers. And that's really how these people are being radicalized in this day and age. And so I created many fake accounts on platforms like Gab and Vote and 4chan. And the, the um, by far the worst is the private messaging services such as Telegram or Signal or, or WhatsApp. There's a lot of private groups in those messaging services that push this ideology. So I created a lot of fake accounts and I um, watched and listened and collected information from these people as they were actively pushing this radicalized content. 
yeah, you're not going to recommend the the, the uh, right wing extremist books, but I would recommend uh, Talia Lavin's book where she does something very similar. She infiltrates a uh, Jewish woman in New York, infiltrates uh, the online neo-Nazi websites and uh, seeks to sort of disrupt and dismantle them. I'm really, I'm really interested in hearing about your online sort of uh, listening in. But yeah, this oh, is wow. a book that parallels that. Um, I have to read that. So what is the reaction to the film? Ben, ha are you thinking that you're hoping that this will be seen by young people or by educators uh, in what settings? Or is it, are you just thinking this is a, um, an artistic expression or like sort of resistance to um, the alt-right uh, outside of those pedagogical situations? I think it's a little bit of both. We obviously wanted, when we created it, um, we were trying to rush and finish it before the 2020 elections because there were many politicians who are mentioned in the film or have little cameos in the film. These politicians are pushing this conspiracy theory from the bully pulpit and that's very dangerous as we all know. So that was an initial goal was just, let's get this done before the 2020 election. Let's have a premiere before the election. And some of these people that are up for election that are in this movie, if that can just push the needle a little bit, why not? because they are espousing a dangerous ideology that gets people killed. We also did need to, to make the film as part of an artistic expression. As we said, we were like outside the country um, while there were events happening that we wanted to participate in protests or participate on the ground here in the US. So it was kind of like a, an artistic and political need to make the film. But in terms of audience, I think that everyone can gain something from it. I hear my incredibly liberal friends, incredibly far left friends, have some of the same rhetorical patterns that the character has early on in the film. Um, I like to say this, and I make a point to say this, that nothing in that film is made up. We took everything from the internet or from my personal life because I was raised in an area that is racist in a country that has a lot of problems with race and racism. And so some of those ideas that that character had early on in the film, the fast twitch muscle fiber stuff, that was stuff I used to believe when I was a kid because people told me that and I didn't think for myself or question that. So I always like to say that, and especially for Ashkenazi Jewish audiences, like, like I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, um, that some of this white supremacy and some of this ideology has just filtered into our minds from our society and we need to figure out where we're stepping over that line or acting like that character in the film like it's not just about the far right it's about anyone can have these ideas yeah certainly like the experts like uh, eric ward and others have said that anti-semitism is kind of the linchpin which holds the far right together so maybe their their most destructive acts are against black people or migrants or but that doesn't in inoculate Jews, white or Sephardi, from the white supremacist culture that we live in and the benefits that we have, uh, the sort of uh, uh, frictionless existence as white Jews uh, in, in this, in this uh, society. So I think that that's really important to note. In other words, like the devil is just not out there. It's also with us and yeah. benefited from um, white supremacist history and white supremacist culture. And I really enjoy Ibram X. Kendi's book, you know, it's bestseller now, How to Be Anti-Racist. Um, he makes a really great point that I love, which is that anyone can hold racist ideas or uphold racist policies. And that's really kind of changed my thinking about, about things. Um, it's not that people are racist or aren't racist, it's that are you supporting a racist idea or policy or not? Or are you actively fighting against that racist policy or idea? So I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, yeah, we as white Jews have a lot of that passing privilege. It doesn't inoculate us against getting killed, obviously, but it's something to consider. Right. And in my studies of this history of kind of organized hate groups, it used to be, you know, especially when I was like a teenager, that it was through, uh, music shows, this is before the internet, a little bit before the internet, like you wouldn't be radicalized online, although all right people were on the uh, cutting edge of, of online culture. It was more about uh, finding a community 
physically in the real world. And so people who intervene in those hate groups, and, and there's an incredible range of memoirs by former skinheads, former uh, white supremacist activists, uh, showing that what they were attracted to was this community and the ideology. And what brought them out of that was also, you know, love or having children or, you know, sort of having a moment of kindness with a, a person of color. And I really liked how you captured, uh, how y'all captured that moment where the uh, Mexican-American woman, I presume, in the cab tries to make a human connection with him and said something which I've always thought, oh, I wonder how this would happen. Uh, doesn't all that hate leave you exhausted? I forgot what the line was. Um, I really love that. So, well, um, sad, Serena can't be here. That was one of her prize moments that we worked out together in the script she was greatly responsible for. And fun story about that moment, actually, if you don't mind. We were in Mexico City finishing up the final drafts of the script and finishing up pre-production right before we were going to fly to LA to shoot it. And we found ourselves on a walk and we found ourselves outside the Holocaust Museum in Mexico City because we were staying in Centro Historico, which was very close by. And I noticed a bookseller. I'm fluent in Spanish, by the way, because my um, family is Guatemalan. And so I noticed on the shelves of this bookseller that they were selling the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. They were selling like translated Mein Kampf. And we were wondering like, well, what the, what? So we went over and I started talking to them and we quickly found out that it wasn't like a mistake or they weren't just like college kids just working whatever job and didn't care. They were Nazi booksellers outside of the Holocaust Museum in Mexico City. And we basically had the moment in the film I was yelling at the guy, just like Jeremiah in the film. Serena was basically being like, come on, it's not worth our time. And she even said to them, like, you know, I feel sorry for you. This must be so exhausting for you to, 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 to believe this kind of stuff all the time. <laughs> and I, it struck her mind because like, wow, we couldn't believe that that moment happened in real life. Meeting people with these ideas who just are just so far gone at that point. Yeah, that's really amazing. So what was the reaction? I mean, obviously I should say, in these memoirs, uh, the sort of decommissioning their hate alliance, affiliations was a process. It wasn't just one thing said. But I'm, I'm actually curious, what, what did they, how did they react to this moment of concern? There were, th there were three people. The main dude I was arguing with didn't, it was just like in the film, it was just, you know, water off a duck's back because aggression, aggression in those moments doesn't really do anything. And then, of course, because I was already so aggressive and Serena was taking a soft aspect to it, um, even the soft stuff seemed to like hit for a second, but then come off. Because, as you said, it's a process. This, um, a really wonderful patron at the Joyce Farm Jewish Film Fest when we showed the film, her husband had worked in deprogramming for 30 years. And it is. People need to be deprogrammed because it is a group brainwash. If it's not from a group, um, it's from, like you said, like a very small community where people feel like they belong in any sort of way. It's the same way that ISIS radicalizes people in a power vacuum, in a, in a need vacuum, they fill it. And they provide what, what these people might be looking for in terms of community and, and connectedness that allows them to tune out everyone else. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Have there been other moments, uh, illuminating moments on the film festival circuit yet for y'all? Yeah, so again, at Joyce Forum, we had a representative of the ADL there to help answer questions. We have a very limited creative partnership with them. Sometimes they answer some Q and A's with us. And the representative who was there, Tammy, she had actually been on site at Poe a few hours after to coordinate with law enforcement. She works for the Center of Extremism and she's helped stop terrorist attacks by troweling these reserves of online hate and finding which people are like blowing smoke and which people are actually serious. So she's helped stop terrorist attacks. And when she saw the film, she said, this is exactly how it happens. I see this every day at work. And that, that really resonated, that really made a difference for us because, you know, it really solidified that None of that research was in vain that we did capture how this brainwashing is happening. And uh, I know that might seem like an extreme term brainwashing, but it, like that's what it seems like 
And that's what experts agree on. I was fascinated too by the way in which um, you know, thinking about the extremists or alt-right or organized racism in the last 10 years, um, I think something we all learned in this country over the last year and a half is that arguing doesn't work. You can show people the factiest of facts and there will be a narrative around it to like the flat earthers at one extreme to vaccine uh, skeptics and COVID skeptics that how can you argue with somebody who's so ideologically entrenched around complicated social matters that arguing is not going to work. We have to figure out other ways to do it. I, I definitely think that, like you're saying, this conspiratorial thinking has been really exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, obviously, that's being expressed not just in replacement theory, but things like QAnon, which is basically, you know, protocols of the elders of Zion recycled with extra steps. Um, and I don't really know what there is to do about a cultural deep programming from conspiratorial thinking, because it is such an easy avenue to solve a complex problem. Someone else is responsible. An evil cabal. Of course, that's why my life sucks. <laughs> like, it's a very easy trap to fall into. And we do it in small ways with our own lives. You know, like, oh, I'm late for this appointment. If that jackass in front of me hadn't done this at line at the bank, like, no, it's your fault. You should have left earlier. That kind of thing. So I don't really know what there is to do in terms of a, of a large scale deprogramming for the United States and for this ideology as a whole. Um, and the sad part is, is that with the experts that we've talked to at film festivals and the experts that we've uh, graciously had conversations with, they're not very sure what to do either. The problem of the algorithm and how effectively it siphons people off into these echo chambers and keeps out other information through search bubbles is new. It's a new new problem. People don't have solutions to yet. Yeah, that's some very wise uh, insights there. I'm also disturbed that some of the solutions weren't, weren't so obvious to even the experts. Um, I mean, if racism or, you know, we always like to talk about anti-Semitism as a virus. Well, then in some ways we should think of it as a kind of public health problem and, and not, not necessarily demonize uh, like your character, but think about what, what are those things that are contributing to that pathology or that mutation of uh, finding, finding, going down the rabbit hole of conspiratorial thinking and blaming. Um, let me, uh, oh, I wanted to ask you, you, you said that there might, there, there were some, when the DVD comes out, out, there'll be some DVD extras of scenes you left on the cutting room floor. So yeah. us really quickly what some of those were. You sounded very excited about that. <laughs> so, there's this great scene that uh, my co-writer, co-director, Serena was in. And of course, we wanted to show the major groups that are impacted by replacement theory in terms of like direct victims and, and people that have been killed over, it, which are, you know, African-Americans or Black, Black Americans, Jews, women, um, LGBTQIA plus individuals. And so we had several different scenes showcasing kind of like each group in the car. And then, you know, after a few uh, screenings for industry folks, we were like, wow, the audience is getting ahead of us. we got to cut one of them. Oh, no. And so Serena had this amazing scene where the main character is, you know, picking someone up. He's an Uber driver. And he has this fantasy sequence where this gorgeous woman gets in the car and is like hitting on him non-verbally. And he's really attractive all of a sudden and really desirable. And then reality snaps back and he's looking at her like a creep and she's freaked out, like, you know, texting her aunt, like, oh God, I'm going to get murdered by this creeper Uber driver. And it was just this really funny because originally we wrote the film trying to be a comedy for so long until we realized it was a horror film that some of the comedy aspects have, still are there in the film uh, today. But this was a very funny comedy film, just showing you know, real, really powerful hammer swing, how this character could go from like self-delusioned about his sexual aspirations to just completely deflated by the reality and then turning ideologically violent because of it. Because the incel um, nature of the alt-right cannot be denied. There's a definite misogyny that is ever present 
Um, and it was just a very fun little scene that would that that was very funny and then very disturbing very quickly. And I'm very sad it's lost from from the film for time and for for content. Yeah, that you mentioned the incel, this incel vibe that's involuntary celibate, the kind of online community of men who um, frustrated with their lack of game, lack of ability to um, have kind of normal dating sexual relations. Um, and there's a the dovetails with all these other murders, hate um, moments. Um, Ethan, let me rope you into a little bit about some of the other films that please in this sequence. And one I wanted to point out takes place in Israel, uh, uh, a short piece, 20 minutes called White White Eye, in which um, it's not clear if it's an Arab Israeli, an Israel Palestinian citizen of Israel, or whether it's a, um, a Mizrahi Jew finds his stolen bike uh, locked outside of a, a gate in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, and he calls the police and says, hey, I found this bike that was mine, which I was, st which was stolen. And now he's the suspect. Who are you? What's your, your identity number? And, and so people are looking at him on the street like he might be trying to steal the bike. So there's <sighs> this level of mistrust about um, you know, this uh, Arab Israeli or North African, I think, at the end of the day, his name's Omer Matthias, and it could go either way, Jewish or, or Arab. And um, then it turns out that the bike was in, the, in uh, actually uh, in the possession of a migrant from Eritrea. So a guy working in a dishwash, dishwashing in the back of this uh, restaurant, then the police are suspected, suspected of him. So, so it's no longer the Arab who is, or the Arab Jew who is the suspect. Now it's the the, the black African migrant. Oh my God. There's the, for those of you who've seen it already, you know, there's this tension where he uh, he's trying to, as the director says, stay human during this whole, remain human during this whole sequence. But ultimately the Eritrean seems to be arrested because his, his visa has expired. And so what starts off is like a, a dispute about a bicycle, which the Eritrean bought underground, you know, on the street from someone who's, who probably stole it now becomes a matter of life and death for his, his, uh, his child. Now, what I wanted to pull this in to the discussion is that on one hand, we love to hate these uh, organized hate representatives, skinheads, neo-Nazis, we're scared of them. We're also glad that law enforcement is tracking them and keeping tabs on them. But what was illustrated in this film, White Eye, is that there's a kind of structural violence that's all legit that not just the Israeli state, but any state does towards its marginal character. So people were suspect, the police were suspicious of this citizen of Israel first because of his ethnicity. And then they're, they're sort of trip over and find themselves into deporting an Eritrean refugee who's now, I mean, this act has destroyed a bunch of lives, a child's life, a wife's life. Um, and there's a different sort of violence that happens every day that's not as sexy and scary as the skinhead. And I think we are, when we're thinking about prejudice and discrimination, we also have to think about the structural violence that, for example, the United States has the last two years, have, well, five, six years, has really demonstrated to white America, persists all the time. The feeling of being a suspect, a fugitive, uh, because of you're, you're speaking Spanish and the, and the the policeman pulls you over and asks to see your identity cards uh, or your African American. White people do not have to be afraid when they're being pulled over by the police, right? We're not thinking, oh, this is going to end in death, right? This is going to end in a hefty fine if we're speeding, but not death. This is not the same for people in Black America. And I think what was great about the white eye, um, this short, uh, is that this shows what this looks like in Israel to an extent, not necessarily against uh, Palestinian subjects in the West Bank, but against people residing in, you know, Green Line, Israel. So uh, I'm glad that your piece and this piece was shown together at our film festival. Uh, I think it says something. Um, so uh, I was wondering what you're thinking about doing next and uh, maybe uh, out of, just off the top of my head, maybe thinking about these other more subtle forms of structural violence uh, and how we live with a kind of racialized violence all the time, 
without this sort of red pilling or uh, radicalization. Yeah, I mean, uh, light and fluffy out of the way first. Uh, <laughs> the next, the next thing that's on our plates right now is that uh, we've written a pilot that was actually a finalist in the Sundance Television Episodic Lab, and uh, we're shopping that pilot around right now. We really hope that that gets bought. No spoilers on it yet, but it would be a comedy to help empathize groups around the world to a mostly Western American audience. And of course we found obviously the high scores a horror film, but comedy as well has such a power to humanize and empathize that we're taking it in that direction now, especially after the suffering of the last year and a half throughout the pandemic, I think everyone can use a laugh. <laughs> you know, as powerful as high score is, it's not always the easiest film to watch. And um, in terms of the structural racism that you're talking about, uh, I mean, it's undeniable. I, I have never, like you said, when, when I've had interactions with the police, it's not come up to me that this might be a life ending situation. Um, but I was also raised by uh, attorneys. My father was a criminal defense attorney and he very plainly told us how the police operate, especially in the city of Chicago where I was from, how the police operate, how they can operate and the, the history behind their operations. Um, so at least in our family, it hasn't always been expressed as it's structural racism, but the abuse of power is undeniable and it happens to every group. And how that corresponds to high score, of course, is that we, this replacement theory ideology is in our politicians' mouths. It's coming out of them. There were so many representatives in the Tuesday election that got elected to the House of Representatives that were involved in the Capitol riot. There were six different politicians that just got elected to Congress involved in overthrowing the government. And all of that kind of conspiratorial thinking behind January 6th was a culmination of conspiratorial thinking, both in QAnon, which is of course racist and anti-Semitic, and replacement theory from the people that pushed the incitement, such as Matt Gates. He pushes replacement theory all the time. Uh, Tucker Carlson as well. So this ideology is structural in this country now. It's now mainstream. And it's really, really damaging to the Latinx refugees and asylum seekers. People in ICE detention right now are having such a hard time even getting in touch with lawyers. And without a lawyer, you can't do anything. You're stuck. Because we, we have a judicial system that privileges people with money especially, and because our economic system, of course, is racist. That means the people who benefit the most from the judicial system are white and wealthy. The people who benefit the least don't speak English, have different skin color than you and me, and don't have as much money. And those people get stuck in ICE detention for years. Yeah, I'm making one last connection, too, with another one of our shorts, um, Mazel Tov Cocktail. Have you seen Mazel Tov Cocktail? German language, um, kind of like a uh, making fun even of the convention of the the Jew as victim. Uh, it's just the opposite. It's just punching Nazis and kicking them. <laughs> and, uh, but there's one disturbing scene where his Russian migrant grandfather is talking to an alternatives for Deutschland, alternatives for Germany representative, and is really excited yeah. and agrees with him about, yes, these Muslim immigrants are a threat, and Islamism is a threat, and alternatives for Deutschland or the German right supports Israel, but they're anti-Muslim. So you're, they're flipping this great replacement theory about Muslims, and the great replacement theory starts in France, where it's a concern over the French-speaking North Africa, Afri African uh, immigrants. Um, so there we have Jews in Europe who are sympathetic to some of these, what we would consider far-right ideas. Um, now, is it a big percentage of those Jews? I don't know. But probably one is too many. And so we should be concerned about this, this uh, um, sort of isolating the enemies of all that's good and just into pathological skinheads or pathological ra the radicals and not also taking a look at how we, as you mentioned at the beginning of our talk, how we ourselves are talking about um, the other in, in social life. 
you know, one of those articles that we actually came across in our research for this film was about a young Jewish man who almost got sucked completely into the alt-right incel movement and his mother dragged him out. Um, the name of the article is escaping me right now, which is so unfortunate because it's a great read. But yeah, anyone can uphold these racist ideas. The leader of the Proud Boys is, is a Latino man, you know? Right. They're not exactly pro Latino, the Proud Boys, you know? So anyone can come into these ideas and somehow justify it to themselves. Yeah. And, and the, the example you're making, I think, is uh, people in the all right who come in as Jews. But there's, a, there's an interesting, I, I collect these examples of Jews who like were attracted to the far right movement, but often did not announce that they were Jewish or covered that over. Um, uh, Lincoln Rockwell in the 1960s, one of his lieutenants that was born Jewish uh, and rose through the ranks, uh, became the basis for a very good film. If you haven't seen it, The Believer with Ryan Gosling from 2000, um, where it, he's, he's born Jewish, but he becomes a leader of a neo-Nazi group. Um, based on true story. Um, very good film. That is nuts. Yeah. I mean, like, very believable, but nuts. And I, I think that, you know, without getting too much into, into this topic, that uh, the term white and how facile it is and how malleable it is, so that back in the 1920s, the KKK wanted to hang Greek people and now Greek people are considered white. And, and same with Ashkenazi Jewish people post-Holocaust suddenly being accepted more and more into white culture until, you know, on a census form, you're checking white. And it really just goes to show that that whiteness in the United States and, and elsewhere is a socio-political concept not really tied right. to your ethnicity at all. Um, right, right. Yeah. And, and I think... Uh, and we should probably wind our wind our. We're having a great conversation, but we should yeah. it down because uh, we have got to move on to the next film festival. So um, the, the 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 idea of, of saying you're participating in white supremacy doesn't mean that we hold radicalized white supremacist belief systems. It means there's a system like patriarchy or others which we we sometimes are doing things that uh, become. Do, do not resist that white supremacist culture. It's not that, uh, so when critical race theorists would say things like all white people are implicated in white supremacy, they're not saying that all people are racist or all white people have hate in their hearts or actively doing harm. It's that we're all part of this larger system. And the, the big question is how do we punch our way out of this or how do we smooth, smoothly uh, try to resist this form? So maybe we could end on maybe your thoughts on, okay, so what's the next step? You know that white men are getting radicalized. Um, what are some things our audience can do so that we're just not sort of observing this from a distance, uh, a distance buttressed by the state and its, you know, um, police agents who in theory keep us safe? What can we do? I mean, I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of care. So I think that the number one step is to catch people before they've fallen too deep into the rabbit hole. And whether that's yourself, um, examining the thoughts that you hold towards other people or really just giving a, an self-examination of the way that you speak and think about others is a great first step. And also, if there's someone in your life who starts to espouse these ideas, I think one of the most powerful words is just why. You can just ask, why? Why do you believe that? And not judge immediately because of course, you know, we, we think, oh, that's bad. We're going to judge that. It is bad. That's not, that's not up for debate. But if you start that way in a conversation with someone else, they're not going to listen to you. You have to just ask why. Why do you believe that? Who told you that? Where did you learn that? And let them figure out for themselves in these conversations where you're being very kind and, and just asking them to explain themselves. I've watched people just kind of like have their wheels turn and be like, oh, I don't really know why I think that. And that's a great first step. If you can get someone to question why they believe something in the first place, they, can, they have a much better chance of pulling themselves out of it. So it's, I would just say kind, curious questioning over judgmental condemnation 
you know, obviously if someone's seek hiling in the street, that's, they're way far gone for this approach to be super useful, but everyone starts somewhere. And if we can get them off that track earlier, better. Great, that's great advice. And for, for those who are seek hiling, there's groups like Life After Hate out of Chicago. Yeah. Who try to infiltrate and interrupt uh, these, these negative patterns and bring people out of these um, yeah. white supremacist, white nationalist movements. And the few uh, deep programming organizations that the Obama administration have been heavily funding. I'm not sure if they've all been uh, reestablished. I know their funding got cut in the last administration, but they were doing some really great work. Great. Well, thanks so much for, for your work, uh, for, for you and Serena, for, for the, the great work that you've provided us. And we wish you all the best luck uh, with, with um, uh, high score for the future. And we hope it gets a, a wide audience and deep Thank you. And thanks for being part of our, uh, our festival. It's been really wonderful to talk to you today. We're really excited to be part of Philly Jewish. Thank you so much. <laughs>